produce. I think this requires the attention of the consumer because before a product moves from the village and reaches the consumer outside the village, it, it might travel a long way to the, all the way to Bombay, Calcutta, Bangalore, Delhi, Madras, or it may even cross uh, the seas and then uh, reach other countries. Now the producer is still being exploited for the hard day's toil. He is not getting the right price. Whereas middlemen who invest money are able to turn it over fast and make a quick buck. And this poor man who toils to produce a product in the village is ignorant, doesn't have access to the city market, so he has to go through a wholesaler and then the wholesaler pass on the product to the retailer. The retailer again pass it on to the petty trader. So when so many hands change, chances are that every, that every stage there is a markup in the price of the product. Because each man is trying like Shylock, uh, a character created by William Shakespeare about 400 years ago, everybody is looking for his pound of flesh. Everybody wants to make a little money. So the profit uh, amount which accrues to every middleman in between the consumer and the producer would probably be much more than what the, what the uh, producer is able to get, it, get himself. Then this, this is on the one, one hand. On the other hand, if you look at the plight of the consumer, probably you'll get to know that he's also being exploited. Lately there has been a, an abnormal increase in the price of onions. I will know if you have read that news item. Uh, 200 times, 300 times. And the reasons may be varied and many, but still the sufferer just happens to be the consumer. And kindly remember, among the clientele, you have several classes. Those who can well afford to buy no matter how much the hike in price of onion sees. Like for instance, uh, a person whose uh, pay, pack, uh, pay, pay packet is in the range of, uh, uh, say, 10,000 Indian rupees or 20,000 Indian rupees a month, probably he can afford to pay the increased price. But look at the rickshaw puller. Have you seen some rickshaws? Uh, the three-wheelers? And uh, uh, look at the hawkers moving about uh, uh, the streets with headloads of uh, fruit or uh, vegetables going from uh, knocking on door to, you know, going from door to door and selling things. Or uh, uh, look at the poor people who will be sitting on the pavement, uh, the roadside, and uh, uh, selling uh, some cooked foods. Now, their plight is indeed very miserable. 
they can ill afford to pay even a 50% hike in the price. Not only for onions, for that matter, any foodstuff, including vegetables. Even the cost of vegetables has been on the rise in the recent past. And some people say that the value of rupees coming down, some people say that they, that they, they have been a hoarding by merchant middlemen. You know, hoarding, they keep stock waiting for a better price and, uh, you know, if uh, government is likely to announce uh, a hike in uh, the price of uh, gasoline and uh, if some uh, uh, petrol bank owners, petrol dealers, are clever and if they're able to know the mind of government, then uh, they might uh, put a stock, uh, put a board there, display a board there, no stock, and hide the stock and then open it for sale only after the government announcement <coughs> is made, increasing the price, price of gasoline. Then they will make such a big lot of money with just one stroke, isn't it? So anyway, among the four P's, I think the area in which many of the rural products stand to suffer is with regard to pricing. Then uh, I told you I would be taking uh, about 25 minutes, so I, I, I don't really wish to drag on this. Then I, I would like to show you one transparency about uh, the case of hand looms, and then uh, I leave the floor open to you. And I believe in uh, give and take, and uh, I think uh, uh, I'll get back home this evening a happy man if I'm able to uh, part with uh, some of my experiences uh, uh, in the hand weaving industry. Um, to question answer uh, session. Excuse me. Uh. <coughs> 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 Uh, you may, as you may kindly see from uh, the screen, uh, in the middle you have uh, Viva as the nucleus. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. What's your good name? <laughs> Mohammed Jalo. Uh, nice to meet with you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. Weaver happens to be at the center of the industry. Then I start with production centers. Now, people who produce hand-woven fabrics could be individual weavers, living in their thatched huts in the villages or living in the government uh, accommodation, like uh, work sheds, you know, provided by the government. Or there could be master weavers, that means weaver, people who belong to the same weaving community but who, with passage of time, could make uh, uh, enough money to employ their uh, weaver brethren. They don't do the work. They give the work to other weavers, give the designs, give the materials like yarn threads, and then give the ornamentation materials like uh, lurex, the silver and go gold, you know, jerry thread. 
and uh, they give them the design, then they give them the pattern, and they would ask them to make a particular fabric uh, in a particular fashion in accordance with uh, the requirements of uh, the buyers in the domestic or uh, foreign markets. These are uh, known as uh, master weavers. Then we have cooperative societies, more than uh, 16,000 of them in the whole country today at the primary level. And then at the apex level, we have as many as about 43 uh, cooperative societies. These are uh, federated bodies, the primary societies. Then at the national level, we have uh, uh, the All India Handloom Weavers uh, Cooperative Society. Uh, it's called uh, All India Handloom Fabrics Marketing Cooperative Society, which has also opened handloom houses in other countries apart from uh, the major cities in India. Then at the nation, we also have another organization called Akash, the Association of the Corporations and Apex Societies of the Handloom. Then uh, we have workers in the handloom industry. That means these are uh, wage earners, people who work for others for a given wage, for a given product, no contracts. They are like any other workmen and nothing accrues to them, no provident fund and no limitation of man hours, working hours and no maternity benefit, no leave of any kind. They are just ordinary workers. They work for the day, then get paid a wage as agreed upon between uh, uh, their master and themselves. It's like a, a master-servant relationship that exists between them for the day. Nothing permanent and uh, no contract. Then we have the Apex Weavers Cooperative Societies, as I said before. Uh, at the uh, provincial level, here we call it a state. Uh, and then uh, the textile or the handloom development corporation at the provincial level. There are 23 such corporations in the country today. They have been established in the year 1975. And the Apex Handloom Weavers Corporate Societies were being organized from the year 1936, and then the primary hand of Weaver's Corporate Societies were being organized from uh, uh, early 30s in the country. Today we have, as I told you already, over 16,000 uh, Weaver's Corporates at the primary level, and uh, depending up, upon how big or how small the society is, Usually there'll be hundreds of uh, people work, working. But please remember, in a corporate society, the handloom weaver is not a wage earner. He is, he, is the, he is the owner of the society, along with other weavers, because he's a member. And he follows the seven cooperative principles propounded by the founding fathers of cooperation at uh, Rock uh, Rochdale in uh, uh, England, United Kingdom, uh, about 154 years ago. Then the products, we have men's wear, we have women's wear, we have children's wear, we have tapestry, upholstery, made-ups, floor coverings, etc. Then the one advantage in hand weaving is that uh, where the machine may not be able to turn out material in the shape you want it to be done, 
or in the kind of color scheme you want it to be produced, there the hand, uh, handloom can do. The handloom weaver has the advantage of inheriting skills which are handed down to him from father to son as a faithful tradition. He doesn't go to school to learn how to weave. He starts learning as a child in the home surroundings. All over the world, before the advent of industrial revolution, this was how cloth was, was being produced. In all your countries, this was the same thing. Before the Industrial Revolution, cloth production was being done like this only. But today, India is able to retain the largest number of handlooms in the whole world. Four million. It's incredible. Many people may not believe it when we say that. But still they are able to do it because our government rightly thinks and feels that this is one area where, you know, uh, po poverty alleviation in the rural area is possible by providing more and more work to people to weave cloth. So it is a contributor to the nation's economic growth. That is how the government views it. And I think it is right. Then, uh, as regards markets, handloom goods can be sold locally in the village itself, and they are purchased by merchants coming from other neighboring towns or neighboring cities or far off cities or even from foreign countries. You know, world famous designers like Issey Miyake from Japan, who enjoys the reputation of being one gentleman who constantly arranges uh, fashion parades in world's fashion uh, center, Paris, by collecting hand-woven fabrics from different countries. And he visits India very frequently. He visits this city, Hyderabad, frequently. He goes to the villages near Hyderabad and he sits with the weaver at work. When the weaver is working, he sits there. Then he tells the weaver what he wants and he places orders. He pays money in advance and he just makes a flying visit, goes away. Once the material is ready, it is sent to him by air. Then he will select some models in uh, uh, Japan or uh, uh, France or wherever he holds uh, uh, fashion presents or wherever he participates in, uh, you know, this uh, uh, buyer-seller meets where uh, designers are invited to give their opinions about the fashion trends in the coming periods, you know, next spring, next summer, next winter. Uh, it is actually the designers who dictate or who forecast which product is likely to move better in the next season. Accordingly, the people who are in textile trade all over the world, they take cues from them, then uh, they get the cloth produced in different countries, and then they get them uh, and market them. So, uh, regional, uh, locally in the village, they are able to dispose the product, by adding little margin of profit and then they are able to send these products to marketing centers in the region to the nearby towns and cities, merchants or uh, you know uh, other middlemen. Uh, they come there and then they pay money, buy the product, take it add uh, more profit and sell it. 
So here, there is a chance, as I was uh, discussing earlier, about the fourth P, pricing, there is a chance to pay a little more to the weaver than what the weaver gets if he sells the cloth to the local villager. But uh, I have been working in handloom sector for the long, uh, I mean I worked in the handloom sector for 34 years. And my experience was that uh, most people who come to buy these products from the village don't take kindly to the weavers and their sad plight because they, they, they would like to take uh, more profit themselves. And the weaver uh, was being exploited. Then the third level is the national level, you know, at Delhi or at Bombay, um, exhibitions will be held periodically. Then uh, there are some exclusive showrooms where people come to buy, well-to-do people, of, you know, uh, rich people, uh, people, the elite, uh, we call them the elite, isn't it? The elitist society. They come to buy uh, designer fabrics by paying very high uh, prices. They don't bother about the price. So there, uh, these products, they move like hot cakes. And uh, it is uh, the shopkeeper who gets a, a majority of the profit. It's not the weaver. Then uh, the fourth level is international, that is exports. Handloom cloth is exported either in the form of uh, material or in the form of made-ups or in the form of ready-made goods. And uh, the demand for handloom products is increasing year after year. Now, at one time, about uh, 50 years ago, handloom products were being sold in what was then known as the traditionally handloom cloth consuming countries, such as Malaysia, Sri Lanka, Burma, then uh, Thailand, Indonesia. You know, where the East India Company was trading and uh, their territorial habits were uh, a little closer to the territorial habits of people here. So th they were called traditionally handloom cloth con consuming countries. But today the picture has changed and uh, uh, a major portion of handloom exports or to non-traditional countries like United States of America, Japan, Australia, Germany, Spain, France, and England. Because people in these uh, uh, developed nations can afford to pay a higher price for the artistry involved in the fabric. There has been a phenomenal increase in the exports of these products to this non uh, to this uh, uh, non traditional uh, non traditional handloom cloth consuming countries, because most of the, most of these countries are affluent uh, countries. And uh, the sophisticated uh, uh, consumers there can afford to pay a higher price for these products because in the mire of civilization, they have lost their craft traditions. So they can import them and they can, for instance, uh, a lady may like to buy a beautifully woven uh, handloom wall panel and display it in her drawing room and when a party is held, she may like to wear a beautiful uh, uh, handloom gown and probably she will be censure of the eyes in the whole party. Everybody will be looking at her and asking her, oh, it's so, it's so cute and beautiful. 
and uh, the colors are so attractive. Where did you get it from? By looking at the wall, at the panel, they may ask her. It is appealing to the eye. Uh, is it very expensive? If she says, I bought it for ten dollars, they may probably not believe it, because for ten dollars you may not get a cotton, get a good cotton shirt, isn't it? In those countries. And uh, this lasts for uh, thirty years, forty years, like that. Whereas a cotton shirt may last only for one or two years, a cotton shirt. So it has the uh, value addition there because of the uh, 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 ornamentation, artistry, and then the design, the eye catching color, and other factors involved. Then, uh, as regards uh, uh, buyers and users, now, government departments in India, they patronize handloom fabric. They, they purchase handloom fabric and use it as a, a livery, you know, for the attendance in government offices. They supply them free of cost, the uniform. And also for the ladies who work in hospitals as ayas, they supply them this, this uh, saris. And then uh, uh, the hospital bed sheets. They are handloom ones in many hospitals. Then military, they supply them to military also, some woolen uh, uh, rugs for use in winter. And they supply to police uh, department uh, the uniform made on hand looms. Even gauze cloth is made uh, by hand loom. Band-aid cloth is made by hand loom and supplied to some hospitals. So there are so many items, you know, which are made by hand, cloth items, supplied to government departments. For instance, the curtain cloth in government offices, they make it on hand loom. Then uh, the, uh, other gov institutions where government has interest, like uh, local bodies, you know, these panchayat Raj institutions, like the municipalities, they are also patronized by buying hand loom. Then there are wholesalers who buy hand loom fabrics or uh, hand loom made-ups or furnishing fabrics. Uh, ready-made uh, shirts, ready-made uh, pants or nighties or uh, casual wear or beach wear or uh, uh, unisex uh, pyjamas, things like that, uh, napkins, towels, bed sheets, you know. And then um, they uh, supply them to different, uh, to the markets in various parts of the country or in other countries. They buy them in bulk. Then uh, at the retail uh, level, you have uh, three income groups, lower income, middle income, and upper income consumers. So depending upon uh, uh, their paying capacity, their, or their purchasing capacity, the hand of weaver produces First, let's take the example of a uh, uh, bed sheet. The hand weaver can produce a bed sheet, uh, which, which may cost 500 rupees. He can also produce a bed sheet, which may cost only 50 rupees, a little over one United States dollar. Because he will use less number of picks and ends, that means less iron threads, and uh, the the colors used may not be as fast as those used in the costly bushes. See? So depending upon the purse, like this, not only bushes, saris, you can find saris which, can, which may cost uh, a, as much as uh, 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 300 uh, US dollars, one sari. They use uh, mulberry silk, and then uh, it sometimes 
if it is four ply, it will be very heavy. It may last for a lifetime if you preserve it properly, 40 years, 50 years, 60 years also. And you may use it uh, for uh, on, on occasion, you know, to attend a party, to attend a wedding, or uh, to attend uh, a religious function, to go to temple, no? Or when some guests are visiting you, so you can, it may last for a lifetime and the investment may not go a waste. And you can also buy, if you walk into the city here in Hyderabad, to a place called Patragati, you can buy a sari for, you know how much, you'll be shocked if I tell you the price. For, uh, uh, I think, one, one point fifty US cent, one dollar fifty cents, American. American, one dollar fifty cents, you can buy a sari. It's possible. And uh, for all practical purposes, it will be attractive to look at, but it may not have the same ingredients and it may not be long lasting. It may not be long lasting. And uh, it may not have the same texture. You know texture? And design-wise, it may not be as attractive. And then about the middleman, uh, we have master weavers, as I told you about them before. They exploit uh, their weaver brethren. Then we have merchants coming from all over and buying product, including uh, uh, people who come from abroad. Uh, they, play, they give money, place order, go, and open LC for the rest. They give advance, open LC there, and then it is shipped, sent by air, and uh, big merchants from many affluent countries, they come, and merchants from Delhi, Bombay, they go to villages and they buy. And then uh, we have hawkers who go from uh, place to place and uh, sell these uh, handloom products, live on a day-to-day -day basis. Then we have handloom dealers, you know, people uh, who take cloth from uh, the village weaver in two ways. Number one, on consignment basis, they take the cloth, sell it, then go back to the weaver and uh, pay him and make a little profit, or they pay cash and buy the cloth, and they sell it and make big profit. It depends. Then we have the uh, state, le you know, apex societies at the provincial level. Their job is to supply raw materials to the primary hand of viewers of societies. Raw materials like yarn, like jerry, like uh, dyes, like chemicals, you know, for the coloring of uh, fabric. And then, uh, in turn, they buy the cloth from them, the finished product, and then they, ran, they run handloom houses, showrooms, in different parts of the country where they market these products. And uh, again, give work, provide employment to weavers. Their main job is to provide employment to weavers and implement the handloom...